open licensing more generally um, is a fantastic way to make your your work available to people uh, to collaborate collaborate especially across institutions uh, I've worked inside of companies that used open source licensing just so that they could collaborate with other subsidiaries seamlessly. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of incredible the boundaries that open source allows us to, uh, to, to work across. Are these... Uh, are, just a quick check, uh, Josh, should we be seeing slides? I think so. Let me... <laughs> okay. Let me, let me try this again. Uh, so we can see the uh, cohort call notes right now. Well, that is, uh, ah, I see. I selected the wrong tab, I'm so sorry. We see them, brilliant. Woo, okay. So this, this is, uh, this is when I said, this is me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, the, the fantastic thing is once you've got open licensing on something, it makes it so much easier to collaborate with people uh, and for people to build on your work. Um, but I think largely the folks here, I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir with that. So uh, I'm gonna move merrily along. Uh, so one of the things that we spoke about in our breakout session briefly was that, you know, I, I may be specializing, uh, specialized in open source uh, and uh, ostensibly I have sort of uh, a, a sense of like best practices for how to build a project that's open from the very beginning. Um, but there are, uh, but even, even given the expertise that I have, uh, I, I have struggled to build open projects. Um, oftentimes they take a little, they take more forethought and planning uh, than they might otherwise. And particularly when you're working on deadlines, uh, sometimes it's, it's, you know, in, in tech, it's really unfortunate that often, you know, things like accessibility and security or open sourcing often end up being afterthoughts. Um, and so like my own experience has shown that to be true despite my expertise. Um, so I think uh, really just wanna implore people to plan ahead of time to, uh, to, to take the time uh, to think about these things so that you can build for an open project from the very beginning. Because um, ultimately, the reason we do open source and, and open licensing is because the values outweigh the, 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 the costs of doing that planning. Uh, but we just need to sort of root ourselves in our commitment to being open uh, so that we do take that time up front to make it happen. So a huge, when, when people talk about open source, uh, they're often, it's a term that's a little overloaded. Um, open source uh, technically just speaks to licensing, right? An open source license is a license that conforms to the open source definition. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and so there are open source projects that are out there that people will just put an open license on it but they may not actually accept, be interested in collaborating with people. Maybe they just wanted to share it. Um, or maybe they, they are, they're interested in collaborating with people, but only people within their organization. Um, and so often when I think about open source, I think about three really important aspects of it. First is the licensing, because um, everything sort of flows from, from that. Um, but the second is the uh, sort of the collaboration model. When people think about open source, it's they're often uh, implying something about the way that people collaborate around a project. Uh, that is that you know, the source code and the assets are freely available and inspectable and that anybody can open a pull request or raise an issue and, and that'll be triaged and accepted from the community. Uh, and the last component is not just the open collaboration, but open governance. Um, and this is, this is one of the uh, more tricky aspects, but you know, for instance, uh, let's look at the uh, Google's Android open source project. It's an open source project. It is under an open source license, uh, but it does not use the open collaboration model because uh, they don't accept pull requests or issues from people outside of the company. And it's not openly governed uh, because, well, it's, it is a Google project and they decide everything that goes on with it. You compare that to projects like uh, NumPy or SciPy, where these are 
projects that are under open source licenses. Uh, they are owned, uh, they, they have an open collaboration model, and they're also governed by foundations and nonprofits that have like an open governance uh, scaffolding. So that there are ways to not just be a contributor, but ultimately to you know, join the technical steering committee or uh, participate in decisions about the outcomes of the project. So I just want to unpack open source broadly because it, it means a lot of different things to different people. And you can see how those three facets can contribute to uh, sometimes some misunderstandings. And it's really important for us to understand what our intent is, what level of openness we're working towards when we're uh, building a project. Uh, suffice it to say, a successful open source project is a lot more than just an open source license. And uh, there are a lot of details here that are included, like you know, at the beginning of the call, we mentioned the code of conduct. Um, you know, event planning, and there's so much that goes into it. Uh, but let's not uh, let's not get overwhelmed with it, because you know, one one step at a time as we build open projects. So all open licenses share these three things in common. Um, the the Free Software Foundation has like the four freedoms. The open source definition has the the ten uh, ten clauses that things must uh, be compliant with to become open source. But ultimately, they all share three things in common. That anyone can use the work for any purpose, that anyone can modify the work, and people can share that work freely as well. Um, in any license, there are both the rights that you get as well as the responsibilities. Uh, no matter how simple or brief the license is, uh, any effective license, uh, certainly any OSI approved license is going to have both of those sections. There are, op there are open style licenses out there like uh, the beerware license or the WTFPL uh, that just says do whatever the you want. Um, and those are uh, essentially considered to be like the WTFPL license is considered to mo like be most similar to like a, a public domain uh, commitment. Um, and interestingly, public domain is not open source. There's some interesting uh, literature around that. Uh, in fact, CC0 is also not open source, uh, but, it's, but it's, a good, it's a good thing, so I'm never gonna dissuade people from using it. The history there is complex. Uh, but as I was saying, there are rights and responsibilities. And often one of the responsibilities that comes with an open license is the responsibility of attribution. Um, so that means, uh, you know, declaring who the who the original author was or where you got it from and, and linking back to that. You'll often notice uh, in particularly it, like in your software applications that um, ah, good question. I'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, you'll often notice if if you in the software that you use, there's there's usually like, you know, an about screen. And in that about screen, there's often a declaration of, of open source licenses and attribution. And so that is where that software maker is honoring their responsibility to, uh, to attribute. Uh, CC BY is a license. Um, in fact, all of, the, all of the Creative Commons licenses are licenses, even CC0, which is in, a, in practice effectively a commitment to the public domain is also a copyright license. So all of these are, are, are licenses that are uh, spelling out uh, uh, your rights and all but CC0 really also spell out your responsibilities. Because CC0 is sort of a commitment to the public domain, there is no responsibility. There is no requirement for attribution. Uh, there is no copyright holder. Um, they've, they've sort of disclaimed their ownership at that point. But, but again, these are all copyright licenses. They are, they are hacks on the copyright system. Um, and so, you know, even the copy left things or the public domain CC0 things, though they're copyright licenses, they're, they're explicitly about disclaiming the copyright. So I mentioned copy left. Um, and broadly speaking, in open source, uh, there are two broad subsets of licenses. Uh, there are the permissive licenses or non-reciprocal, and there are definitely different words used here. Sometimes the words have baggage, uh, so I, I try to be pretty even-handed in how I describe them. 
um, permissive licenses uh, like MIT BSD or the Apache license 2.0, uh, they don't require, so, so, so say you take a piece of software and you make a derivative work from it, you, you modify it. Um, in a permissive license, you are not required to share your modifications under that same license. You can license them differently. You can license them under proprietary license. That's, that's totally up to you, and it's, it's your prerogative to decide what, what you want to do there. On the other side, we have copyleft licenses. And even in this category, there's a continuum from, from weak to strong copyleft. Um, and these are sometimes called reciprocal licenses because I, as someone who has authored, say, GPL v3 software that you are now using uh, and you are now modifying and creating derivative works with, because it's under the GPL v3, you are, have a responsibility to provide your modifications under that very same license. Um, and there's things out there like the AGPL, which is a, a, a strong copy left license that specifically speaks to uh, software that operates over a network. Um, ultimately, these are all valid and good licenses. Um, and picking one, uh, don't worry, it doesn't need to be too complicated. Uh, but ultimately, you, you will need to make a decision about, uh, depending on the use case of your project, uh, what, what is appropriate for you. So open source is really all about copyright. Uh, it's not about trademark. Uh, and of course, there are at least three areas of intellectual property law. There's, there's copyright, there's trademark, and then there's also patents. Largely, open source licenses don't say much about patents. Um, some of them do explicitly, this explicitly uh, include a patent grant to the people who are uh, using that software. Um, the precedent that the whole industry is operating under right now is that even if an open source license doesn't in explicitly include a patent grant, the operating assumption is that there is an implicit patent grant at the very least. Um, so I know that patents, uh, and especially in, in context of academia, there's a question of, of tech trans or translation. How does this technology or how does this, this work uh, get translated to, uh, to, to industry or to something that'll drive impact? Um, and I know that uh, I was just recently at Johns Hopkins um, trying to Help, help some of their good people in their library persuade their tech, tech transfer people that uh, you know, open licensing is not, uh, is not to be feared. Um, and so anywho, patents are often one of the things that people get a little, uh, my, you know, people who are not used to open licensing, they can be sort of afraid uh, of the prospects here. Um, but suffice it to say, patents, uh, there's an implicit, if not an explicit, patent grant when you put an open license on something. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't patent things. It just means that you're, there's, there's a grant that's flowing through that license. So there are, happily, uh, tools and resources out there to help you navigate choosing a license. Um, Choosealicense.com is pretty great. Creative Commons has a lot of really plain language uh, explanations of the different licenses that they have. Um, the number one thing that I would recommend is looking, you know, not only looking at these resources, but if you are uh, creating a project or, or, you know, writing some code to, 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 to analyze some results or whatever the case may be, um, look at the licenses that are common in the community you're releasing the code into. So uh, in the JavaScript ecosystem, uh, it's often the MIT or the BSD license. Uh, in the PHP ecosystem or in Java, uh, it's often the Apache license. Um, and like there's no value judgment on those things. It just happens to be sort of common practice within those communities to use a given license. Um, and so if you're looking for um, collaboration and participation from people in that community, you know, abiding the community norms is a pretty pretty solid way to start um, engaging with them. So consider both what is typical in that community as well as what the specific constraints and, and goals are of your project. 
uh, and these resources will help you navigate that those decisions. So open source is really, really just about code, um, which is, you know, obviously the work that we all do is so much bigger than just software. Um, we deal with data, we deal with imagery, we deal with other all manner of assets, we deal with hardware. Um, there are open source hardware licenses. Um, and Creative Commons does a fantastic job of providing licenses for open, open data and sort of open content. So whether it's for the white paper or the textbook or the data set that goes along with the project, uh, Creative Commons is a really, really fantastic sort of catch all uh, set of licenses. And of course, there are variations that include, uh, you know, require attribution or require you to share your code, the derivative works in the same way. Um, and then there are ones that even are, have a non-commercial clause. Of course, once we add non-commercial clauses, well, that gets even further from open source and open licensing because then we're making judgments and putting restrictions on who can, who can really use it. Um, so there's a question here about what happens when we import multiple libraries from other projects um, and which licenses uh, apply to the work that we're creating. So this is a really good question. Um, there are two triggers in licenses uh, generally to be aware of. Um, one trigger is distribution, uh, which is like the moment that you are distributing uh, the software, whether that's, you know, I'm running it on a web server and you're using it or, uh, uh, or I'm sending you software that's on a disk or I'm sending you a little robot or a little sensor that has software I've built on it. Those all count as forms of distribution. Um, and the distribution uh, usually has, that's where some of the responsibilities kick in, like the attribution um, or the requirement to share your work in the same way. Um, when you inevitably, end up using software that's licensed multiple different ways. Uh, the one that applies to you, no well, apologies, let me back up. So first distribution, second is the derivative works. And in copy and copy left, the moment you make a derivative work, and that means really modifying that software. So if you look at a, uh, the Linux operating system, uh, there's broad agreement under and understanding that if I modify the Linux operating system itself, that's me creating a derivative work. And therefore the software, because it's a, under a copyleft license, the software I create needs to be shared under that same license. However, if I'm building an application on top of Linux, you know, similar to like, okay, I'm not modifying Windows, but I'm building a software for people who use Windows, same thing, Linux, Mac OS, what have you. Um, if I'm building something in the user space on Linux, that's not a derivative work. Um, and so I'm not required to distribute my work under the license that, that Linux is under, which is GPLv2. So the most restrictive license isn't necessarily the one apply, that applies to your work. You have to ask yourself two questions. Uh, what are you distributing? And what are you deriving your work from? Um, and those are obviously like, not always trivial questions to come up with answers with, um, but there are lots of good people in the community who are, are happy to provide advice on these things. Um, obviously, always recommend speaking to legal counsel, but I'll also say that the Open Source Initiative does a lot of low-key consulting for people. Um, you know, whether it's the uh, you know the EU and their copyright directive, or uh, the U.S. and their federal open source policy or various agencies trying to figure out how to use open source or, or universities doing the same. Uh, th there are, we exist and we're happy to help uh, provide guidance. So uh, here are a number of resources that I think, uh, there were a few that were already included here. I added a couple, my, a few myself. Um, these are excellent resources for getting more information, uh, both about the licensing and more generally building open source communities. Um, you know, open source guide is one that I've added here that specific that includes questions of licensing, but also like, okay, 
how do I build a community around this? What are really the key components of a community? You know, code of conduct is a great start, but what about the governance? How do we rec recognize our contributors? Um, how do I set expectations with the community? What expectations do they need me to set? You know, all of these questions, uh, I'm happy to say are like not new. Um, and so there's a lot of prior art out there uh, to help provide guidance on these matters. Um, forge your future with open source. Uh, I apologize, that's a, that's, a, that's a book. It's not open source book either. Uh, and and uh, further apologies, disclaimer, it's written by a good friend of mine. But it is a really, it's, it is the only book that is written specifically for newcomers to open source. Um, and I think it has a lot of uh, really useful information in that regard. Uh, Producing OSS is a, a book that is open source uh, from Carl Fogel, one of the former directors of the Open Source Initiative. Uh, incredibly useful information. And uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't underscore the open source definition there at the top. Uh, that is, of course, the definition that the organization I'm a part of stewards and uses to judge whether a new license is open source or not. Um, so I think, I think that's the extent of what I've got for you. And I apologize, I think I might've gone over time, but I, I hope that was useful. <laughs>